Hi folks, uh, thanks for joining us for our virtual Bible study on Revelation. I am thrilled that you're here. Again, uh, just a few things before we jump in uh, to our study today. Uh, some housekeeping kind of things. I, I want to make sure that I commend you guys. I have just, uh, I, I really, really believe that as much as possible, Christians need to be in the Word of God and studying it. And I know that's a big deal. I really do. Um, but man, this gives us a great way for that to happen, for people to get on virtually and study the Word. And so I commend you for that. I'm very, very thankful for the dozens and dozens and dozens of people who are doing that. Uh, keep it up. Keep it up. And I want to verify again that we all know how we're actually posting this. We'll eventually get to where, you know, we all understand it. It's real simple. But we we post it on our Facebook and YouTube pages Tuesday evening at 7 o'clock. And it is left there all Tuesday night. You can watch it anytime you want on Tuesday night. And then on Wednesday morning, we take it off those platforms and we put it on our website and we put it on our church app and it just kind of lives there. So if you need to catch up or you want to go back and re-watch one or new people coming into the study, those studies are always accessible on our website and all that happens on Wednesday morning. So we want to try to encourage people to come Tuesday nights so that kind of gives the feel that we're all coming Tuesday night together to study the word, but it's available from then on to on different platforms. So hopefully we'll all get kind of used to that. And I want to emphasize again um, how important it is, whether you're on um, Facebook or YouTube or you're watching on our website, to share that, to make comments about it, uh, to punch that like button. I don't, I don't understand how all that stuff happens, but what I'm told is every time you share or like or make a comment, it expands it. And there's just more and more people watch it. So uh, the way to get a lot of people in the Word of God is for you to help us out with that. So make sure you do that. That's a powerful, powerful thing, um, particularly at the end of the study when people are saying, hey, I learned this or I didn't know that. Th those are just, they go out to hundreds of people. And uh, it just really goes a long way in helping us out. So uh, needed to say a few of those things before we get started today. And man, we have got a lot to get through. So um, get your seatbelts on and we're going to rock and roll together. So let me pray and uh, we'll get started. Let's do that. Father, once again, I thank you for your word, uh, your beautiful, beautiful word, uh, the light to our path in life. And uh, I just ask for your anointing as we look at it right now. Uh, help me to be able to uh, clearly explain what uh, you have helped me understand in study. I pray that your spirit will make it relevant to our lives. I pray for really open minds and soft hearts for all of us as we see what you've written to us. And I want to thank you that we have the privilege to have your word right here in front of us. So bless our time, Lord. We look forward to glorifying you. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Okay, so today uh, we're done with chapter one, and now we're going to jump into the actual letters to the seven churches. Those happen in chapters two and three. All seven letters are there. Now, there's a couple things I want to uh, emphasize again about the letters. We've talked about them, but I want to make sure you understand these uh, so that we're all on the same page with that. Remember, seven means all, complete, total, whole. We're going to talk about that all kinds of times in the book. And so although these letters were written to specific churches that actually exist in the first century, because there were seven, God was saying the messages apply to all churches and all Christians. And so we're going to jump into a couple of them today, and you're going to you're going to notice that man, that sounds like my church. So wherever you go to church, whatever church you're associated with, you're going to find applications in these letters. Seven letters means all churches. And the next thing I want you to remember is the general structure of all these letters. I mentioned that in our last lesson. 
and it's going to help you an enormous amount to write down this structure. There's seven parts of the structure of every letter with very little exception to that. So those seven things, if you've not written them down, try to do that right now. It's going to save you a lot of time as we come up. Commission, character, commendation, condemnation, correction, call, and challenge. I know that was a lot, so let me say it again now, and I'll do it slowly. Number one is commission. Number two is character. Number three is commendation. Number four is condemnation. Number five is correction. Number six is call. And number seven is challenge. And so you're going to find out that all of those letters, when John wrote them, I mean, he just literally went down that list and he wrote them in order in that structure that Dr. Merrill Tenney came up with a long, long time ago and has taught us since then. So when we study the letters, we're going to go right down that structure. That's why it's going to help you to have that right in front of you. Okay, first a letter was written to the church in Ephesus, chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. Um, we're going to read it, and we're going to jump right into it. Our hope in this lesson is we're going to get through both Ephesus and the second letter, Smyrna. So let's go. We're hitting the, we're hitting the accelerator here. Revelation 2, chapter 1, to the angel of the church in Ephesus write, these are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked men, that you've tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for not my name and have not grown weary. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. Remember the height from which you have fallen. Repent and do the things that you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. But you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. All right, let's make some sense out of this thing, and let's go down through our structure. Uh, we begin with what is called the commission. What the commission is, is simply the commission to write to a particular city. So every letter starts with that to the church in. And in this particular one, it says, to the angel, the messenger, the church in Ephesus, write these words. So when we look at the commission, one of the things we try to do with it is, is that we try to pay attention a little bit to the actual uh, city where this church exists. And um, we turn our attention to Ephesus in this first one. Ephesus was the major city in that part of the world in the first century. That part of the world was called Asia Minor, and Ephesus was like our New York City. It was an enormous place of population. It's probably listed first either because it was the first on the mail route. We talked about that in an earlier lesson, or simply because Ephesus was the largest city. And we just don't know why it was listed first. It's probably one of those things. I think one of the inter interesting things about the church in Ephesus is that it is listed in other parts of the Bible, not just Revelation. The book of Acts tells us when the church in Ephesus was started. And it tells us a lot of different things about the church uh, in the book of Acts. Uh, Paul ministered in the city of Ephesus. And I'm actually going to be talking about that a little bit in my sermon this week coming up. 
Um, Paul wrote a letter to that church uh, that is in the New Testament. It's called the letter, the book of Ephesians. Um, Paul wrote to Timothy and gave him some instruction on how to minister in Ephesus. And so there's a lot of stuff about Ephesus in the Bible. It is a big city and a very well-known church. So this is a big deal. Now we go to the next part of the letter, and it is called the character. And the character is a description of Jesus. And once again, in every letter, we're going to find John going to this part where he describes uh, what Jesus is, who Jesus is, what he looks like. And this is the nerd in me, okay, but I find this fascinating. Last letter, or last, last lesson, we finished chapter one, and you know if you went through that lesson that John went through all this description of who Jesus was. When he saw Jesus, he looked like this, and he had all these descriptions. Now, when he starts writing to the letter, the churches in chapter two and gives them the seven letters, he goes back to chapter one, and he takes some of those descriptions that he used in chapter one, and he brings one or two of them over, and he uses them in the letters. That was not by accident. In chapter 1, this is what Jesus is like. And then in chapter 2, with each letter, goes back and grabs one of those and brings it into the letter. Let me give you an example. Chapter 1, verse 12. So that was uh, last lesson. John wrote this. I turned and saw seven golden lampstands, and among the lampstands was someone like a son of man. Now, we know what that means from last lesson, and that, that is the lampstands were the churches, and Jesus welcomed among the churches. So in chapter 1, he said, that's what I saw in Jesus. He also said in verse 16 of chapter 1, he said, in his right hand, he held seven stars. And we know from our lesson in chapter 1 that the seven stars were the messengers, the ministers, the leaders of those churches. So Jesus walking among the churches, holding the leaders, the servants in his hand, helping them at every route. That's all chapter 1. Now we get to chapter 2, he starts writing to Ephesus. He goes back to chapter 1 and brings those things in. So if you look at chapter 2, verse 1, we read this earlier. These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. Beautiful concept of understanding the structure of these letters, how, how John wrote them. Every single one, the, the, uh, the commission right to the city, and then the next thing, borrow a character trait from chapter one and bring it in here. Now, here's why I want you to understand why that is so important in Ephesus. What we're going to find out in these churches is that they had some problems going on. And some of the Christians in those churches were not the stalwart followers of Jesus they needed to be. They, they probably had some issues in the church on the whole. And that was the case of Ephesus, and we'll find that in a minute. In other words, these places didn't have it all working out exactly how God wanted it to be. But Jesus wanted them to know this. That even though you're not exactly what you're supposed to be, Jesus wanted them to know, I'm still with you. I'm not abandoning you. I'm not leaving you. I am among imperfect churches and imperfect leaders and imperfect Christians. That's where I live. Now, I'm going to mess with some people here, and uh, some folks might catch that a little bit edgy, so I ask your forgiveness. But we all know stories, and some of us are the stories where we didn't see something that we didn't like about our church, or we didn't like something going on in our church, or we didn't agree with something, or the minister said something that you know, threw a wrinkle at us or something wasn't where we wanted it to be. And so we just leave and we go find another church. I want to be bold and I want to say this to you. You might leave, but Jesus never does. And I think that applies to our own life as well. Just because you're imperfect doesn't mean that he throws his hands up and says, hey, what? I, I am out of here. Now, that is a lie from the enemy. Jesus exists 
among the lampstands and holds the stars in his hand. And those are imperfect, and he's not leaving any of them. Well, the next part of the letter moves to the commendation. And man, they were doing a lot of things that Jesus wanted to say. Great job. I praise you for that. Um, I think it's a little interesting side note here that I want to make sure you catch this. And we'll probably hit it a few more times in other letters. We, we, we're going to talk about the commendation. Here's what you do, and that is good. And then the next thing we're going to find out is he talks about the condemnation. Here's what's not so good. Pay attention to that order. Commendation and then condemnation. That is a purposeful strategy that Jesus used because he knew that if he needed to confront somebody about something that was wrong, he was going to commend them first. He's going to lift them up before he knocks them down. That's a beautiful strategy to remember whenever you're in a position where you need to correct somebody, you need to, you need to condemn them for something. If you're a parent, you've got to correct a child, or you're in a marriage and something's not quite right, or you're at work and somebody's got to call somebody out, remember the value of that order. Jesus used it. Commend before you condemn. Some of us come in with both barrels condemnation and it don't go good. We wonder what happened. Well, no wonder. Commend first, condemn second. That's exactly what Jesus did here. And man, there was a lot that he commended in Ephesus. Um, he was really pleased with them. He used two whole verses, verses two and three. He said, man, I am pleased with your deeds and your hard work. Uh, don't miss that. Following Jesus is not just some passive thing that, you know, you just kind of go along in life and, you know, whatever. No, Christian faith is active. It is doing something. And apparently these Christians in this church at Ephesus, their faith was doing stuff. And so I think it's a great way to look at your own faith. What, what are you doing about your faith? I mean, what is your faith actually producing? And Jesus thought that was a big deal for them. He, uh, he's going to sound like a broken record here. I don't know if I've had one lesson yet where I haven't mentioned it, but Jesus took note of their perseverance. He's actually mentioned twice, verse 2 and 3. He comes up. It's going to come up over and over and never going to stop. Christians don't quit on God. No matter how hard things in life get, they don't go backwards in their faith. They don't get worse in their holy lifestyles. They don't get less connected to their church, they persevere, even if Satan is beating them up, even if they're getting beat up a little bit. And these Christians in Ephesus, um, they were going through some stuff. They were getting terrible persecution, but they would not quit. And Jesus said, I want to commend you for that. He also told them that they could not tolerate wicked men. And, and Jesus said, I commend you for that. And man, I'll tell you what, if there's a message for our day, boy, oh boy, at a boy. We, we are living in a time right now where we are told at every corner, you, you look on social media, you turn on the news, you read the page. I don't know. No matter where you look in general American society today, and here's what we're told. We're to tolerate people. We have no right to judge anyone for anything. And Jesus was pleased with the Ephesians that they didn't fall into that trap. They did not tolerate wicked people. And did you see that some of these wicked people claim to be apostles? Jesus said they claim to be apostles. Apostles means sent from God. And, and he's probably referring, when you notice when we read the letter towards the end of it, it called a group of people the Nicolaitans. And the Nicolaitans were followers of Nicholas. And who these people were, were they were people who said they believed in Jesus, they accepted Jesus, but they also thought you could perform some activities of your life that would be understood as being immoral. They ate food that was sacrificed to false gods. They believed 
in sexual immorality. They accepted immoral uh, lifestyles among people. And, 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 and Jesus writes this letter, and, and John tells Jesus, or Jesus tells John to write in there that you cannot tolerate those people. You cannot tolerate those people, and I commend you for that. And I just got to thinking about that a little bit. People who claim that they're apostles, that you, you think about that. We're talking a Christian community who has accepted levels of immorality and indecency. And man, that sounds like today that, that I am I am overly concerned with lifestyles today that Christians tolerate. And not only tolerate, but sometimes encourage. And, and John writes the Ephesian letter, uh, the letter to Ephesus, and says, Jesus commends you for the opposite. You did not tolerate that. Now, that was all the commendation, and then we move into the fourth part of the letter, which is the condemnation. And uh, I think the letter generally, when we read it earlier, it generally has a whole lot more feel of, of Jesus saying, man, I'm, I'm pleased with you. Things are going great in your church. Uh, but there's one thing that he wasn't pleased with, and it was a big thing. And he, he comes in the fourth verse, and he says, but I have this against you. He said, here's, here's my issue with you guys. And apparently they had forsaken or left or abandoned what was called their first love. You left your first love. You're doing all these other things right, but you left your first love. What is that? We're not real sure. Some people think it might mean they were backing off in their love for God. Some people might think they were backing off in their love for people. Some people might have been a little bit of both. We, we just don't know that. What we know is that here was a group of people who they knew right from wrong. They did not tolerate wrong. They stood on truth. But I want you to hear this. They did it with such a fierce stance that they didn't do it lovingly. They didn't do it sensitivity. In, in, in Ephesus, law trumped love. And Jesus wasn't happy about it. It, it was a big deal. In, in fact, if you go back to the letter uh, to the Ephesians in the New Testament that Paul wrote, it's interesting that even Paul knew that the Ephesus church had this issue. They stood on that which is right like a bulldog but they didn't do it lovingly or tenderly or sensitively. And so when Paul wrote the Ephesian letter in chapter four, verse 15, he talked to them about speaking the truth in love, to stand on the truth tenderly, gently, lovingly, not with a mean spirit. There's a balance that the Bible talks a lot between, between truth and love. To stand on that which is right, but be just as passionate about loving people while you're standing on that which is right. And the only one who ever really got that perfectly in balance was Jesus. Uh, when John wrote his, his, uh, his gospel account of Jesus, write down John 1.14 sometime and just go read that. And it said, the word, referring to Jesus, became flesh and made his dwelling among us. In other words, he was born, came to the earth, and we've seen his glory, the glory of the one and only. And listen to this. He came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Grace and truth. Love and truth. He balanced it perfectly. And most of us tend to get that out of balance. We tend to lean one way or the other. You can think about yourself right now and, and just ask yourself when you see a, uh, an atrocity in the world, when you see some kind of evil thing in the world that's not right, do you, tend, do you tend to get really heavy on the truth and the law part or do you tend to get really heavy on the, the love and the sensitivity part? And usually we get it out of, out of kilter a little bit. In Ephesus, they put all their weight on law and no weight on love. And Jesus was not pleased with that. 
and he said, I'm against you because of it. This is a big deal. Once he makes that condemnation clear, he moves to the fifth part of the letter, which is the correction. <clears throat> what the correction is, is Christ saying, okay, here, here's, here's how we're going to fix this. And he said, remember the height from which you've fallen, the way you used to do this. So apparently they, they weren't always this way. They were more in balance with law and, and grace at some point. And he said, he said you, you remember that. And you almost feel a little bit like a cheerleader there, him saying, you guys could do this. Not long ago you had this working right. Now come on, no excuses. Let's get back to where we were. You, you almost kind of get that upbeat, you know, encouragement feel. And then, then you see him saying, repent. That was a correction. Just repent. And the word means to turn around and do the right thing. And I find it there's nothing in there that, that gives a kind of a thought of, you know, hey, think through this and kind of map out a plan and start working on it and take a bite at a time and get a little bit better this week, a little bit better next. None of that. He just says, fix it. Fix this and fix it now. This was a big, big deal uh, to Paul. I think one of the most powerful things ever written in any of the seven letters comes up right here. He's, he said, man, you're doing great in these things. Here's the things I, I, I need you to fix. It's not going right. You got to get that in balance. I want you to fix it. I want you to fix it right now. And, and then he says this. Now, if you don't fix it, I'm going to remove your lampstand from its place. And we know what lampstand is. It's church. You don't fix it, I'm going to take your church away. Here's what John was saying. To have a church where they stand on truth but do it in an unloving, non-compassionate manner is so damaging to the cause of Christ that it would be better just not to have a church there. I want you to hear this real, real carefully. Historians tell us that today, in that part of the world right now, we don't have a church there. Jesus meant exactly what he said. You don't fix this, I'm taking the church away. And apparently they didn't fix it. After the correction, we move to the sixth section of the letter, which is called the call. And uh, this is the same in every letter, all seven letters. The call is exactly the same word for word. And it is this phrase, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Everybody has an ear. Everybody has an ear. He's saying, everybody listen up. And biblically, when you heard things, that meant you obeyed them. That's the whole point. Um, one of the lessons earlier in James chapter 1, verse 22, we, we saw where James wrote, don't merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Don't just listen, do what it says. So the call is always, hey, everybody, hear this and obey it. And then finally, the seventh part of the letter is the challenge. Every letter ends with a challenge. And the challenge basically means, now if you fix this, here's the reward you're going to get. Here's what you're going to receive out of the deal. And all seven letters have the challenge overcome. It's that word, overcome. That's why uh, the title of this whole study is Overcomers. Overcome. It means that I'm going to overcome the issue that is happening to us right now. And for those in Ephesus, it means that we will continually overcome this issue of truth without love. We're going to fix it, and we're going to get a reward for it. And the reward is that you will eat from the tree of life that is in the paradise of God. Every reward in all seven churches is a picture of heaven. You fix this, you get this right, you go to heaven. And that was a major motivation uh, to the Ephesian Christians as it should be uh, to us as well. Uh, they were strongly compelled to fix that issue so that they could experience the heavenly reward that would be promised them. Okay, so that's, that's the Ephesian church. That's the letter to Ephesus. Um, you're standing on right, great job, awesome job, but you're not doing it in love you got to learn to balance that. It's that important. Now we move to the next letter, 
which is Smyrna. And I think we've got enough time to rock through this one real quick, and we will look and see what uh, the Spirit said uh, to the church that existed in the city of Smyrna. So let's read it. It's in chapter 2, and uh, it starts in the 8th verse of the second chapter, right after uh, the Ephesian letter. So chapter 2, verse 8. To the angel of the church in Smyrna write, these are the words of him who is the first and the last, who died and came to life again. I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. I know the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for 10 days. Be faithful, even to the point of death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes will not be hurt at all by the second death. Okay, let's grab our, uh, our format again, our structure, and let's walk through the letter to Smyrna. We start with the commission. Uh, Dr. Tenney's structure there, everything starts with the commission, right to Smyrna. So when you're talking about Ephesus, the big deal about Ephesus, largest city in Asia Minor, really big, important place. Smyrna was incredibly wealthy. Uh, one historical account that I read through recently had the city nicknamed the Pride of Asia. Incredible wealth, a lot of money, a lot of marketplace stuff happened in Smyrna. But when you read the letter, you probably paid attention that the Christians were living in poverty. So how can you be poor when everybody else is rich? And, and we're really not told why that's the case. It's probably referencing the persecution that Christians were receiving in that day and time. Maybe they weren't given the choice jobs where there were a lot of jobs in Smyrna. Uh, maybe they weren't allowed to buy products that other people purchased. Maybe they, they uh, in the secular community, didn't buy from the Christians at the marketplace. We don't know what the reasoning is, but we know that there was financial persecution to the Christians in Smyrna. Uh, emperor worship was a really big deal in Smyrna. They would actually build... Uh, think of them as church buildings, temples, synagogues. They'd build these large buildings in which people would gather together to worship whoever was politically in charge at that time. And John kind of hints at it when he says to them, when we read it, you probably caught that. He goes, I know where you live, where Satan has his synagogue. His synagogue is there. And, and so he's probably referencing um, that very thing. The first and second commandment in the Old Testament, the Ten Commandments, God gave to Moses. He made it crystal clear that only God is to be worshipped. Nobody else is worshipped. No other thing is ever worshipped. And that was being violated in Smyrna big time with emperor worship. And that's why he said the synagogue of Satan. Now, the second part of the structure is the character, and we're going to learn this. we we'll get through the seven. Right now, I, I want it to kind of start generating you so that you know this. The character is going to be a picture of Jesus that he's going to borrow from chapter one. Remember that? So he goes back to his writing, picks one of those things that he used to describe Jesus, and brings it back into the letter. And with Smyrna, he, he used this. He is the first and last who died and came to life again. And so he's talking about the fact that Jesus is here, that he's present. He died, but he came to life again. And what he was probably doing there, he was probably just giving a slap to the worship of emperors because all the emperors die. All the emperors die. And what made Jesus stand out among them is his ability to remain alive after his resurrection. If anybody ever wonders or asks you, you know, what's the difference between Christianity and any other religion in the world? What's the difference? How do you know yours is right? What do you got going that the other one, there's one thing that always stands up. Our God is alive. 
our God is alive. Jesus died and rose from the tomb. There's not a, there's not a religion or a faith on the globe that claims that their leader rose from the dead. This is the only one. And, and John was probably playing with that a little bit when he said, I want to describe Jesus as him who is alive again, because no emperors could do that. All right, we move to the uh, meat of the letter, and that is the commendation. So we go to the third part of the structure, and John now starts saying, okay, here's what Jesus is really proud of. You're doing great, and Jesus is going to praise them for that. And it comes down to one thing in Smyrna. You'll remember in Ephesus, he had all kinds of different things he talked about that they were doing well. Smyrna, one thing. They were faithful even though they were persecuted. And I've said it a dozen times in this study. I'm going to say it throughout the study until we're done. Faithfulness is the message of the book of Revelation. Faithfulness. And so we've got this battle of good and evil that we all deal with in our life. And man, it was happening in a big day in Smyrna, um, wealthy city. They were poverty stricken because of persecution. And in spite of all that, they stayed with God. They did not give up on God. And that's the theme of the book and is the commendation to the church in Smyrna. As a pastor, I, I, I can't even tell you how many times this happens. Um, I just had a conversation the other day with some folks on our staff just broken hearted over some people where this happens to them. And, and it happens when life gets a little tough and, and things get a little muddy and we get, you know, we get some bad stuff happen to our life and things just don't go right and life gets squirrely and we've all been there. And, and then there's this tendency to start to move away from God and, and slowly move away from the lifestyle that you lived and slowly uh, lessen and lessen your connection and engagement with the church. And as a pastor, I see it all the time, all the time. And Smyrna is the one place that they didn't let that happen to them. They stayed and were faithful and persistence in their walk with the Lord, in prayer, in believing with the community of faith and gathering together to worship and serve, they were faithful. And John calls them out by Jesus and said that he is so pleased that they've done that. And he even said, you're doing that in light of your persecutions. And if you paid attention, he listed their persecutions here. He said, your afflictions, we, we are not told what those are. That word just means to be burdened. It means to be pressured. It means to be knocked down. So they were being afflicted in spite of their poverty that we've already talked about. So the Christians in Smyrna were being financially hurt. And then there was slander that people called them names. They would say bad things about them, probably things that weren't even true. And in spite of all that, they remained faithful to God. So this, this is probably a, a time where I think it's good just to stop for a second, kind of breathe and be honest with yourself with this. If affliction and poverty and slander we're just being thrown at you because of your faith in Jesus. Would you stay with Jesus? Would you stay in your faithful lifestyle of holy living? Would you stay engaged and committed to your church? This was a big deal. And they didn't go backwards and John said, that's the one thing Jesus wants to commend you on. So you've got the commendation that leads to the next part of the structure and the condemnation. Here's what's not going well. Here's what Jesus isn't pleased about. And so now it's time for the condemnation and something remarkable happens here. If you write in your Bible, you ought to put a little asterisk right here. There is no condemnation in this letter. None. Now let that settle with you a bit here. 
John is writing a letter spoken to him by Jesus to write this. And Jesus, I want you to write the letter to the, the folks that are in Smyrna. Write it to their minister, write it to their leaders, write it to their people, and just write them a letter. And this is my evaluation of them. And there is nothing that I see that I want them to fix. Nothing. It's the only one of the seven letters where that happens. All other six, there are things in which Jesus condemns. So why is that? Uh, it might be that there was nothing to correct. Um, that may be the case, or at least nothing significant. Probably what the case is, is the tenderness of our Lord is showing up here. Um, these people were getting smacked around for their faith. I mean, they were undergoing heat. And, and they were hanging in there in spite of it. And maybe Jesus just says, you know what, I'm, I'm just not going to burden them anymore right now. I'm not going to beat them up right now. I'm not going to condemn them in any way. We're not sure if it was because there was nothing to condemn or he was just being tender or a combination, a little bit of both. But there's no condemnation in Smyrna. Now, although there's not a condemnation, there is a correction. And you would say, well, why is there a correction if there's no condemnation? Sometimes correction is just hey, an encouragement to keep on doing what you're doing. Uh, sometimes it's fix something. Sometimes it's like, hey, keep it up. You're doing great. Keep that up. That seems to be the case here. They are told not to be afraid. And that kind of sounds ridiculous to me because here we're talking about a group of people who are undergoing persecution. And then John tells them this. There's a bit of prophecy. He says this. And oh yeah, they're they're gonna throw you in prison, okay? And and a lot of you are gonna be in prison for ten days, and some of you are gonna die in the imprisonment. But hey, don't be afraid. And you, you read that, you go, okay, I don't know about y'all, but I hear that, and man, I am afraid. And how would anyone not be afraid? Well, for the first reason is you look at it. And they're only in prison for 10 days. Now, we know already, we've already passed this. We're not looking at this literal. What's he saying? Is that sometimes when Satan's power comes in the battle of good and evil, and when he really knocks you around a little bit, God is ultimately in control of this. And God will limit that. God will always limit our persecution. God will always limit our hardship. In the grand scheme of eternity, it will always be short. Why can you not be afraid? Because God's in control and he will limit that suffering. Now it's at this point that he sticks in the call. We already know what that is. All Letters get the call. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says. And so you know right now what the call is. Hear it and obey it. So for Smyrna, keep being faithful. Keep being faithful. Keep being faithful when life is hard. Don't go backwards. Move forward. Stay with God. Keep being faithful. You're doing a great job. And then the letter ends with the beautiful seventh part of the structure, and that is the challenge. And we know by now all churches got the challenge. Uh, you do this, and here's the reward, okay? And all churches, the reward deals with heaven. And so he said, you will receive the crown of life. What's he talking about? Picture heaven when you get there. Why is the Smyrna church going to get there? Because they were faithful during hardship. And then this weird part of the, the challenge comes up. You will not be hurt at all by the second death. What is that? What in the world is that? Well, that's going to need some explanation. And it's going to be hard to do this on video, to be honest with you. Um, if I had a big chalkboard or something, I could write it. But I'm, I'm going to need you to write something down. And if you're not writing... Just kind of picture it in your brain as best you can. Revelation will talk often about what is called first death, second death, first resurrection, second resurrection. Now, if you're taking notes, I want you to do this. I want you to write first death, put a dash, and write physical. And what that's referring to is everybody experiences a first death when we physically die on this earth. Under it, I want you to write second death, put a dash, 
and write spiritual. The second death is our experience in hell. That if we don't connect our life with Jesus and never accept Jesus, live for him, never make that engagement with Jesus, then after our first death, then there is the promise that second death will come in the form of a place of punishment, Gehenna, hell. That is the second death. First death is physical. Second death is spiritual. Now, write first resurrection dash spiritual. The first death was physical. First resurrection is spiritual. And that happens while we're living on this earth and we become a Christian. We turn our life over to Jesus and we're filled with his forgiveness and we're promised heaven and we're given the gift of the Holy Spirit to reside within us. And when people become Christians, there is almost an elevation of themselves spiritually in their connection with God. And so if you are a Christian, if you've given your life to Jesus, you've experienced what Revelation will call the first resurrection. Now write second resurrection and write physical. And we're going to find that come up later in the book of Revelation when we talk about after Jesus returns and we are all gathered in heaven and we are all given a new body, a new resurrected body, and that is this second resurrection. Now that you know, first death, second death, first resurrection, second resurrection, we go back here, and he says this, if you're faithful, persecution, slander, affliction, poverty, evil having its day in your life, if you're faithful to me in the midst of that, you will not be hurt at all by the second death. What's he saying? In blunt terms, you won't go to hell. You will not go to hell. Faithful Christians, let me tell you something. You do not have to be afraid of hell. You do not have to be afraid of hell because you're faithful. And God gave that promise to that church. So there we go. Uh, two churches, Ephesus and Smyrna, uh, letters that were meant for them, but man, applicable to all of us. The uh, message to Ephesus, don't be all law and obedience with no love and grace. Message to Smyrna, stay faithful when evil will have its day with you. Stay faithful. So next week, we'll jump into a couple more. Pergamum and Thyatira. And their messages are as interesting as their names are. So I'll see you next week. And until then, share, comment, like, get this out of here. You have a great day. Love you all. God bless you.